Hello. Guess what day it is? It doesn't even matter what day it is because you know what? I'm in Germany. I'm in the future. I have no clue what's going on right now, but what I do know is that the lovely, the lovely folks at Game Sports allowed me to use this wonderful studio in order to record Day 9 Daily, number 264, where we learn to be a better gamer. And very exciting news, I actually just got done recording this very daily, but um, the mic wasn't on. So I talked for an hour, and you have no idea what I was saying, but I looked very enthusiastic and silent in the recordings. So we're going to go ahead and do this whole daily over again. <gasps> That's what we call preparation. I'm quite excited. Uh, but before we go into any of that dailiness, I wanted to share a little bit of the Kingston HyperX Pro for a Day Grand Final. That is right. The winner was none other than the illustrious Jace Wallace for this last week. You see that? Ladies, this is why Taryn is the best. Uh, that was the number one voted one. Indeed, you, you find folks selected that. And now comes the last phase. Go to facebook.com slash hyperxcommunity. And when you go there, you can vote for one of these five individuals. And the winner will be flown out to the Penny Arcade Expo to hang out with me and in control for one full day. <gasps> you may purchase friendship for 24 hours from me via voting. <clears throat> So, of course, for any of you who have not participated in the Kingston HyperX community, a little giveaway jazz, go there. Go to Facebook.com slash HyperX community because all the fun submissions are still up. Uh, so you can check them out and have some lovely, lovely laughs. So definitely do that. I would be much appreciative. So, of course, we're going to be doing a little bit of an analysis on a game that uh, when I first did the analysis, I hadn't seen it. So there was all sorts of uh, cool opportunities for me to be all, ooh, I have no idea what's going to happen. Let's focus on it. And then, um, again, I had no sound in the recording. So now I'm doing it again. Bam! have a little bit of extra knowledge that I can use to share with you. Let's go ahead and pop into the game and notice that my face is still on screen. Perfect, 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 perfect. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. In the bottom left corner, we have a gentleman named Prince SG. And in the top right corner, you may not be able to determine this, but this is, in fact... Into the Rainbow, or ST Rainbow, or Saint Rainbow, however Startail likes to identify their players. Hmm, hmm, wonderful apple soda. Uh, that is correct. We have Into the Rainbow spawning in the top right corner. Now, this is what's interesting to me about this game. I'm going to be just sort of showing you the screen. You're going to see that, oh yes, everything looking completely ordinary. Again, most normal thing in the world. However, someone once upon a time, and by someone I mean Kaldor, who showed me this replay, he said that this Terran player is going to be opening Mass Marines. Oh, is he now, right? He's not just going to be opening Mass Marines. He's going to like be making Marines like the whole game. Oh, it's so crazy. That's how Kaldor described it to me and why he recommended it to me. Because he wanted me to just oh, be really excited about this really weird set of units. However, I want you to forget this for a moment. I want you to just dump that fact outside of your brain. Because so often what can happen is that what you think is polluted by what other people say. So for instance, let's say we're watching some game and I tell you, yeah, Protoss wins with a four warp gate rush. He wins with four warp gates of units. You're constantly gonna be just subtly convincing yourself that what the Protoss player is doing is good and what the Terran player is doing is bad, right? It's very hard to get that objective um, view again when you have that later knowledge that colors it. So what I want to try to do is bring up that later knowledge so that way we can try to shove it back out of our brain because we can't exactly go through our lives in StarCraft being super naive. Uh, it's very important to notice these trends and try to stop them um, and to try to be able to be objective. So we see our Terran buddy going for a barracks uh, and no gas. Oh, interesting. Almost certainly going for an early expand. Cool. Protoss player going for a gateway and then an assimilator. So what I'm going to be doing for much of the early stages of the game is talking about what both players are doing in a normal sense. We're going to hit a phase where suddenly we're going to see mass marines begin to get in action, but first we want to talk about it in terms of an opening, in terms of an opening, because there's a huge difference between how you open, uh, which would be all the things like how do I not die versus that, how do I put pressure on that, how do I worry about that, um, and then the mid-game is more about what sort of unit mix you want. So it could be like Marine Marauder Medivac. It could be Marine Tank Thor. It could be Hellion Thor Banshee. It could be just Marines, right? But that is your mid-game. That is a separate component from your opening. So in the opening, I'm going to ignore what these players are doing. 
uh, or excuse me, for the opening, I'm going to focus on what these players are doing and ignore what I've told you about the mid game. Let's go ahead and ignore that. Let us ignore that. We're seeing Prince SG going to be getting a Zealot, and then he's going to be building. This is the last probe he's going to build for a little while. So we're going to see a Stalker pop out real soon, followed by Warp Gate. Let's talk about openings real fast. We see the Terran going for a one barracks command center. Wow, he's even getting that uh, command center before his supply depot. That's super duper duper early. Holy goodness. And we'll likely be throwing down some barracks here, maybe even a bunker for support. Protoss looks like he's going for some sort of one gate expand. We haven't seen any sort of gas yet. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about why what Protoss is doing is brilliant. Notice, no probes getting made. Look at the food, 24 of 26, no pylon getting made. In fact, this Protoss player is going to be saving up and expanding. Now, I just want you to note that most of the time when you do an early expand as Protoss, you're making a lot of probes. Your expansion generally starts at 30 food, 30 food. But look at this, there's gonna go down to the Nexus. And as we see, no probes still being made. And then suddenly we're going to see a stalker. There we go, there's a stalker getting made. So very common early little mixture is pushing with a zealot, one stalker, and then two stalkers, right? This is very, very, very common. The reason that I got so excited and wanted to spend such an extraordinary amount of time on this part of the game is that it's very easy to get caught up in the huge, big, broad things. Like, for instance, should I get a robotics facility and then expand, or should I not get a robotics facility and then expand? That's like a huge, juicy thing to do. Should I get an immortal or not get an immortal? But what I want to emphasize is that what we're seeing Prince SG do in this game is a normal looking early expand, right? One gate and then an expand and then probably going to add on some more gates. However, he's doing little tiny things like cutting some probes here, skipping a pile on there, um, building some extra units there, using chrono boost in a clever way. And that is really is what, what's going to be pushing StarCraft forward. Not people going, I have decided that a Robo Bay is the best thing to do. No, the Robo Bay is not the best thing to do. It would be something like, you know, cutting a couple probes and getting a Robo Bay that you didn't think you could have gotten before. Oh, like these sorts of things. So I really like, again, how normal this is. I really do like quite a bit how normal this is. And by the way, just to state for the record, if for some reason I, my video, is chopping or going crazy, that's totally my fault. Your computer and your PC is running fine. I am just an absolute miracle worker in terms of demolishing um, the efficiency of the production studio. I completely ruin technology. I'm like Harry Dresden. Oh, hope you caught that reference. So we see this good push happening by the Protoss player. Um, poking in here, doing a little bit of damage, losing a Zealot. Terran has three barracks that he's using to make as many Marines as he can. We're going to see a second Stalker. Yep, there it is. We also see probes have now begun to resume production. We see some more gateways coming down. Um, but Protoss is going to be pretty relentless in terms of production. Oh, hey, you know what? Four barracks going down. There is the refinery going down. Cool, good stuff, good stuff. Let's talk a little bit more about Protoss' opening before we do a big shift over to Terran. So Protoss has his gateways going down, right? As general good opening logic, as general good opening logic, we can say fairly confidently that, you know what, if I don't see some sort of ultra-fast gas, I'm not worried about Banshees. So I saw an expansion command center. I don't really need the robotics facility to get any observers. I can comfortably get some uh, gateways first. Very comfortably, right? This is classic early expand logic. Probably the biggest decision with early expanding is when do I get the robo because I know I'm going to need those observers eventually, right? That's always a big decision for Protoss. But hey, you know what? This is just general good structure. The reason I'm making a big deal about it is that Prince SG did this weird hold on the probes and hold on the pylons. <laughs> Said Sean as though he was a scary ghost. He did this weird little rearrangement of, uh, you know, getting the stalkers and the zealots and pushing and taking the expo on 24 food. What? But everything else is normal. Everything else is normal. Everything else is just as it should be in the world. So that's good. That's great. That's fantastic. Now, in terms of our good buddy Rainbow... We see a lot of barracks coming out trying to defend against this little bit of aggression. It's kind of obnoxious because if uh, you know the Protoss player is good enough, he'll be uh, doing an amazing job of picking off these Marines from afar. So there he is, yep, doing some amazing nips. Yep, doing to pick stuff off. This is just three units that Protoss is attacking with. One Zealot, two Stalkers, and is doing so much damage. Um, now, what Terrans generally do is they generally try to throw down a bunker a little bit earlier, but we're seeing the Terran trying to repel as best he can. Without doing that, 
we see more Marines coming down. We see one geyser going out. Now, ordinarily, you see a Terran player do. Ordinarily, you see him get two geysers, right? You see him get two geysers and begin to go add on crazy, right? Makes a tech lab, maybe another tech lab. Maybe keeps these two guys with no add-on. But, man, he gets the stim and the combat shield pretty fast, right? He definitely needs those two gas. We're not seeing that out of Rainbow. He's instead favoring just making a lot of Marines and SCVs, staying fairly mineral heavy with his composition. And we see the Protoss player, oh, throwing down a fourth gateway. Does that make sense based on our usual early game logic? Yes. No real threat of Banshees, no huge threat of Marauders or Tanks, you know, no reason to get an Immortal, no reason to get an Observer. We can make more gateway units to help us stay alive and do other sorts of good things. Let's put pressure back on our opponent. So we've seen some pretty typical openings from both of these players. Some pretty typical openings. Um, Terran is going to begin doing an early push. He's going to begin doing an early push, and I am going to just hang out here until a little bit more magic happens. We're going to see some more barracks get thrown down here. Um, nah, you know, I'll spend a brief period of time looking at this micro battle. Oh, he ends up pushing forward. Protoss is a little bit underprepared. Marines retreating from the force field, yada, 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 etc. Uh, he's sprinting forward now. What are good things to target in this attack? Uh, generally, anything that you really can, but the sentries are pretty easy to target, because you know what? They die really easily. Let's get the target fire going on there, but he's going to dash forward to pick off just about anything he can. But it's going to end up being somewhat unsuccessful for our Terran guard, right? This is one of those moments where a lot of players are kind of like, Ugh. Maybe we might think that we shouldn't have attacked as Terran. Terran who salvaged two bunkers is now rebuilding two bunkers. There we go. Here is the money moment where we're really starting to see some development happen. We're really starting to see some hints as to what is going to occur in the mid-game. So, let us stop for a moment and reflect. What have we done in this daily thus far? We've looked at a game between two players where both of them did pretty normal things. The Protoss did a one-gate early expand and then made more gateways. The Terran did a one barracks expand and made more barracks. But there were some weird things we could identify, like the Protoss who did his early funkiness with when he built the Nexus. The Terran did some early funkiness, like skipping the bunker, like not getting a second gas geyser. But you know what? Overall, pretty darn clear. Now let's start talking about some funkiness. Let's start talking about the funky things that both these players are doing. I'm going to begin with our Protoss hero. I'm going to begin with Captain Protoss getting his very fast Twilight Council and then opting to get some more geysers. We're actually going to see a, an, another geyser start here in a minute, but I'm going to keep it paused. just want to let you know that this gas will be going down pretty soon. Twilight Council. Basic good logic is when do I get the robotics facility? Well, hell, this guy was early expanding. He was defending with Marines. He just attacked me with a bunch of Marines. Look, you can even see the black charred remains of their corpses on the ground. There were a lot of Marines getting built. So what does that mean? Well, Terran, who just lost a lot of Marines, really can only defend himself by making a lot more Marines. I've said the word Marines so many times that you're probably getting the hint that Banshees are not coming, right? There's not a lot of Banshees coming for the Terran. So we're going to see Protoss safely, smartly, go straight for Templar. Really smart. He's only been making Marines. He's kind of forced to make Marines so he doesn't die right now. Storm's going to be awesome. Yes, very cool. But now let's talk about Terran, because this is, this is what might seem a little bit weird for people. This is what might seem a little bit weird about the idea of having fewer units in the composition. So now I want everyone to note the fact that there's a lot of Marines coming out, and I'm going to tell you, Almost only Marines are going to be made for the remainder of this game. Let's talk about normal games. Let's talk about not this game. I don't know. Let's pick a matchup at random here. Protoss vs. Terran. Um, in a usual Protoss vs. Terran, and you know what? As well as in a usual Protoss vs. Zerg, as well as in a lot of the other matchups, what do you see? You see, okay, one guy over there, he's, he's going to make... You know, he's going to make his Colossi, and he's going to get some Void Rays, and he's going to get some Sentries and some Zealots, and he's going to hang out. And then at, like, 160 food, he's going to move out with his Blob. And then this guy over here, he's going to make his Blob. And his Blob, he's going to have Marines and Marauders, and he's going to have some Medivacs and some Vikings. That's his Blob. And then what happens is two people are sitting there. Their Blobs are swelling. Uh, right? And then they merge their Blobs together, and one crushes over the other one. That's what we usually see. 
Why is that what we usually see? In StarCraft 1, there were so many crazy dynamic battles happening all over the place and all this sort of craziness. What, what was different? Is StarCraft 2 a worse game? No, no. In fact, it is the logic of players thinking, I need to build unit X to beat his unit Y. That's the core reason why the blob syndrome happens. What you'll hear a lot of people do that drives me nuts is people will ask the question, would unit bleh have helped in that battle? They'll look at a battle where there was a whole bunch of marines and Zerg couldn't quite crush it, and they'll say, would banelings have helped there? Ooh, in this battle, would a raven have been good? In that battle, would a infester have been good? Every unit in StarCraft II is good, all right? Every single one's good. There are no terrible, awful units that you shouldn't make. Every single unit can serve a purpose really, 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 incredibly, unbelievably well. Every single unit. But there's a big difference between getting a unit and having the unit magically exist at a moment. Like, let's say I'm going Zerglings and Mutalisks. That's a lot of gas into my Mutalisks and my remaining minerals, I go to Zerglings. And then a player sees a big cluster of Marines and says, wouldn't Infestors have been good there? Yeah, but then I would have had half as many Mutalisks and I could have done no damage with my harassment, right? And if the Infester existed, it would have been good, but getting it is just too hard. So that is a huge error that I want to just point out right now. We're going to see a lot of Marines come out in this game, and I don't want you to be saying to yourself, hmm, this unit X would be good if it existed, but by getting X, it would have completely screwed up Rainbow's ability to do almost anything else. I'm going to be highlighting that a lot. And I bring this up because it relates back to this concept of the blob of, well, if he has that unit, then I should get that unit. If he has that, then I should get this one. What happens is these players get into these modes where they're really passive, just trying to build up their proper blob. This was happening a few months ago in Protoss vs. Terran, where the Protoss would say, all right, I'm going to get some Colossi, because those are good. Well, Vikings are killing me, so I'm going to get some Phoenixes to kill those Vikings. Well, I better have uh, some sentries in there as well to throw up some force fields. I guess I have some minerals left over, so let's get some zealots. Um, well, you know what? Void rays are probably going to be good eventually. And then what happened is you have this Protoss army that's really kind of not so big, but has a million different kinds of units in it, right? A whole bunch of different kinds of units. So then the other player is like, okay, well, I guess I want to have some Vikings for those things, and I want some ghosts for that, and some marauders for that, and some marines for that, and then better get a Thor in there as well. And, you know, if I threw in a Banshee, that wouldn't hurt so much. And then this is where the blob thing comes from. Everyone's sort of trying to outpredict each other's compositions. So that way when they move out, my blob can eat your blob. But here's the big concept we're going to be hearing me say so many times, you're going to want to mute me, but I'm not going to let you. Speaking of muting, good, I haven't inadvertently turned off the mic yet. Yeah. Here we go. The bigger variety of units you get, the smaller your overall army is. The less variety of units that you get, the bigger your army will be. So in terms of people getting a whole lot of variety, they'll both be pretty even in food. But if one player is, say for instance, only making Marines, you'll see the only Marine player like up here in terms of food. Not necessarily a better army, not necessarily the most efficient army, but it's a bigger, it's a bigger overall army. So we're going to come back here into this game, we're going to come back here into this game, we're going to see a whole bunch of mariners getting produced. Now, uh, Protoss is doing his usual mix. Okay, I'm going to be getting some stalkers and some zealots, maybe we'll see some sentries come up soon. Is that a sentry? Oh god, I'm so good, there's the other gas. Oh yeah, I'm going to be wanting to get my Twilight Council. What's Terran doing? Marines! 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 Nothing but Marines! He's making so many Marines! Oh my god, he's giving the reactors and everything. I'm actually going to back up to right before these reactors get constructed and just repeat the word, Marines! Marines! He's getting a lot of Marines. So many Marines. So what I want to note here is the advantages that having a really big army gets you. This limited variety, but big army. Number one, we have a lot more mobility. Why? Because we have a bigger an army, okay? Our army's huge. We can move out a little bit more. This is not just with Terran. If, for instance, you're Zerg and you're sticking with just Zerglings and Roaches, no Banelings, no Mutas, no nothing else, you can get, uh, you can move out. You can expand a little bit more because you have this very lean army set. You're not spending all this stuff on like upgrades and Spire and Banelings. It's lean. This army is going to be able to move out really, really early on. So you can expand more. You can put pressure on in other circumstances. It's not so good at dealing with the 
um, I don't want to say the counter units, but the obvious things that are really good against it. Like, if you go Mass Marine, you're going to be worried about Banelings and Templar and Colossi. That's just what you're going to be worried about. So let's um, pop back into the game. And one thing I wanted to note, one thing that's really cool about getting um, a lot of barracks like this, some people might say something like, why is he getting barracks 5, 6, and 7 when he could just get a reactor, a reactor, and a reactor? The answer is that when you take uh, a third base, it's a lot faster to add, to get add-ons on six existing barracks as opposed to get three more barracks and then get three more add-ons. I really think that in the future you'll see players very often get the unit producing structure instead of the add-on and then when they start expanding then they'll get more add-ons. The difference here is that Rainbow is basically only going to make Marines no matter what so he's going crazy and making a ton of Marines right now. So. Let's come back to this one unit only concept. I don't even need to open the production queue because you know what? It's like just Marines. There's that number of Marine production is going to be going through the roof in just a moment. So let's actually close that. With just, uh, with a small set of units, sure you have this mobility, sure you can move out and be aggressive, but I want you to always be thinking for a certain unit, what size of an army does this unit operate best in? What size do Marines operate best in? I'm going to argue that it's a middle-ish size that they operate best in. In huge numbers, Marines can get stormed very easily. In really small numbers, things like Zealots rip them apart really easily. But in middle-ish numbers, it's pretty easy to control them. You can move them around. You can do a lot of interesting dynamic things with them. All right, interesting. So what does this mean? We kind of want to be engaging our opponent a lot with this kind of army. We want to be doing a lot of aggression because if we kind of have a big army, he kind of has a big army, and then we trade, and now we're kind of the smallish, middleish army, suddenly Terran immediately has an advantage. Like, immediately has an advantage, and will want to press it. So let's see the way that this battle looks, and how he reinforces it, and how that's different from the usual Terran mix. Let me just note for the record, Protoss is building up a good old mix of Zealots and Templar. He doesn't have the Zealot with charge. He's almost there to storm. Here comes a very aggressive push. Notice that our Terran is quite, quite ahead of our opponent in food. He's actually 10 food ahead, which is pretty incredible considering that this Protoss player killed off a big push and also did damage right at the start of the game. But Terran is still ahead because Terran, who's having this lean, extremely narrow variety of units, he can easily get a lot more units. Notice. No money spent on Gas Geyser. No money spent on Gas Geyser. No money spent on Gas Geyser. This engineering bay hasn't even started an upgrade. I mean, there's been almost no expenditure on anything except just Marines and Barracks and all those associated thingies. So here's the scan. We see this Terran player moving in. Now, watch what's going to happen. Here comes the scariest storms in the known universe. Terran's kind of going, whoops, today, because my combat is not done yet. So, oh, there's a storm doing a huge amount of damage. Oh my god, another storm doing a huge amount of damage. This entire half of the army is dead. Look at what's so different about the way that this army looks versus how another push from Terran would look in another matchup. Look at the limbo line. It's like an ant colony of Marines just rallied. All of them are actually rallied right here to the opponent's natural expansion. This is quite unusual um, to see a Terran player going a little bit nuts like this. But look, now that these armies are starting to get reduced in size a little bit, oh man, it looks just terrible for this Terran player. But you know what? He's stimming some Marines down here. And suddenly, now that we're kind of getting into this middle-ish number, looking a little more comfortable. The Zealots are struggling a little bit more. Oh man, and look, some more units try to spawn to do some damage to here. Now we're going to see Rainbow blunder hard and just have his units on move instead of attacking. But hey, now that we're starting to get into the middle-ish small numbers, look at the way that those Marines are doing so much damage. Protoss is kind of scrambling to be able to stay alive at this point. Now, if Terran regrouped here, I really think Terran could have won this game, like, now. <laughs> but we're going to see Terran cleverly suicide all of these guys and this guy and, like, half of these more. There we go. Very good. Fighting those. Uh-oh. Nope doesn't end up getting them, but that's okay because we have some more guys marching off to their death. Very good, very good, very good. From Protoss' point of view, from Protoss' point of view, total logic, lots of gateways, lots of gateways. Actually, probably too many gateways. There's a robo facility, because again, you always kind of need that eventually. Typical, standard, nothing too special logic. Just probably needs to get charged um, at some point here. 
but we're gonna see again this weird weird mass marine play from Terran Here's another total of 10 Marines have given their lives for nothing so this is looking increasingly hairy for the for our Terran buddy now I want you to note that let's say Protoss backed off and waited till like hundred and fifty food Terran would look really bad, right? It would look really bad. I'm sure all of you kind of have this internalized feeling of how these Marines should work, right? In huge numbers, ugh, it's not gonna look so good. But once we start getting to those medium smallish numbers, a lot of you can sort of see visually, yeah, that's actually probably not so bad for those Marines. So at this point, you know, this probably would be pretty bad for these Marines. But here's gonna come an interesting moment of mobility. So here, let's look at the resource station. Terran, who got mauled, has just caught back up again. He's even suicided 10 Marines and is still a little bit ahead of his opponent with one food, basically the same food as the opponent, but still, suicided some units, ooh, seem to get mauled. Lean army mixture, lean army mixture. And we're gonna see uh, our Terran buddy go for a counterattack here. Now this is where the game takes kind of an odd twist. I want you to just note during this battle, we're gonna ignore this counterattack for the moment, but watch how this battle, oh, here's the storm, does maximum damage, another storm that does maximum damage, another storm that does maximum damage. But then after all those storms happen, despite having very, very few marines out on the field, this ends up working pretty darn well for our Terran buddy. And here comes a whole bunch of marines just going to be able to clean up the main price Prince SB getting mauled here. So, so is Terran. So is our Terran buddy. But Terran, look at that. Look at his frickin' cool so far. A frickin' head of his frickin' opponent. But now that the Archons are starting to work their way in, it's gonna be a little bit of trouble. Again, these rally points make me, make me cry. And this is going to be uh, a little bit of an odd situation. And this is... At this point in the game, I'm gonna stop again and do the what have we learned moment. So in the first part of the daily, we looked at their openings and just said, isn't that normal? In this second part of the opening, we looked at a little bit of odd, funky looking skirmishes where Terran was being really aggressive and really aggressive and really aggressive. And the armies were very much so nudging up against one another throughout that period of the game. And I'm gonna stop right here and just say, okay, now we have to focus on this crisis phase, because now we're going to look at some crisis management. But I want you to recall just the last five minutes that we've been looking at this game, there's been that funky aggression from the Terran, that funky, funky, funky aggression, right, where he just seemed to be really up in his opponent's face. Is it good? Is it bad? Huh. It's actually really good. Uh, I don't want to be like Will C, but you know what? So considering he's going Mass Marine, he went Mass Marine in a very correct way. There's a lot of mules getting thrown down, maybe both of the economy can cut so we can get more units. The marines in the main still doing tons of damage, would have been great if they picked off all of those supply depots. Again, in really small numbers, these marines are going to be struggling to get the zealot. It looks like the Terran buddy is trying to get as many of these marines out as he can and bring some SCVs. This barracks is going to fall in a tragic display. Uh, it looks like the zealot has... Uh, completely shut down with mining for the time being. And now we actually have ourselves a very interesting spot. And this is where we're going to see suddenly, in the midst of this crisis, Terran is going to be springing way far ahead, right? He's going to be springing way far ahead, and it's kind of thanks to this little lean army mixture. The fact that he's able to produce so many of these small units, whereas Protoss kind of needs this variety. Protoss is also in a little bit of a rough spot, so he's also going to go for a lean unit mix. Just Zealots and Templar. You might say, don't you mean Zealots, Templar, and Archons? Well, the Archon's basically two Templar, right? So I'm just going to call it Zealot Templar. And we're already seeing our Terran player begin to leap quite far ahead. I know a lot of you want to be like, oh, yeah, it's all because of mules and all that jazz. Uh, Terran does have a pretty significant econ boost at this phase. But still, we're going to see something very noteworthy happen really soon here, which is that Terran is going to do what we were saying before, where, whoops, fewer units, so he's going to pull ahead in the food count, but when he gets into battles, this is going to happen, right? They're going to bounce back down to the same level of food, and then Terran's going to begin pulling back ahead again, because this is not a super efficient army mix. It's not great against the Templar, it's not great against Archon Zealot, but there's just so many units coming out on the field. There's so many Marines that are out there that Terran can go ahead and, and exploit that very, very well. And look, we have one Marauder out. We're going to see, you know, like, maybe one more Marauder happen all game long. But maybe we don't. 
going to come back to the Ghost Academy. I'm just going to note that there is a Ghost Academy. Meanwhile, Protoss is correctly mining a lot of gas here. Probably should be mining gas a little bit more there. Because, you know, the, the Archons and Templar are pretty pretty darn necessary to face. But I also want to note, once again, like just moments ago, this looked really scary. But the instant that these Marines get into kind of a small-ish, smallish to medium-ish mix, they're suddenly really, really good. Once these Zealots end up falling, we see these Archons suddenly just not really seem as terrifying. They're going to get easily picked off by these marine numbers. Like, I mean, only four or five marines ended up getting picked off. That is constantly what Terran is trying to aim for. Now, we do see that there's a bunker going down, but Terran would be wise to wait just a little bit and then move out again. Just a little bit and move out again. Now, I want to talk about this Ghost Academy because this move right here is w inspires so many of those classic comments. Wouldn't, wouldn't a ghost be good right now? Wouldn't... Wouldn't a raven help? You know, there's a, wouldn't it, Unit X, if it's existed, help? Well, yes, because every unit in StarCraft II is good. But I want the following words to resonate in your brain until you're dead. I want you to re remember the following words. A strategy does not become perfect when there's nothing more to add to it. It's when there's nothing more to take away from it. You want very lean strategies. So in a sense... We, we're not starting with Mass Marine and going, and we can get tanks. Let's see if we can get some tanks in there. Let's see if we can get some ghosts in there. Let's see if we can maybe get some ravens in there. What we instead want to do is say, I want to take away everything to where I just have Marines. Did I take away too much? And it's kind of like, oh, you know what? I really kind of do need those ghosts. All right, Marines and ghosts. Can I take anything else away? Probably not, right? This is a very minimalist strategy that relies on having a lot of stuff, being aggressive, and having map control to gain more expansions. If I were doing this Mass Marine, I'd probably have one less barracks, and I'd be expanding a little bit more, more rapidly. But, um, but still, the idea is there of trying to have as few things in there as possible. Fewer, 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 fewer things. So I don't want you to think, oh yeah, and he just sort of... Uh, you know, thought ghosts would maybe be a cool thing to get in there because he thought, yeah, wouldn't ghosts be helpful? Well, no, you know what? There are Templar here. Damn, I can't just go Marines. I have to really get those ghosts out. And once I have ghosts and Marines, there's nothing else that I can really take away. Everything has a real necessity to it. So, I mean, for instance, just as, as, as a counterexample, a Terran player who's going Thor, Tank, Marine really early on could probably say something like, hmm, could I maybe not build these Thors and just go Marine Tank? And that's what we've seen Terrans do a lot in Zerg vs. Terrans early on. They just go Marine and Tanks. Because again, you want to peel all the things away. Could I maybe not go Marauders and just get Marines and Tanks? Yeah, you know what? Marine Tank Medivac is another lean company. Not as lean as just Marines, but it's lean. It's lean, baby. Terran moving out again. See lots of infantry getting produced. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Here comes the Mariner. It's going to be doing a little bit of action. One thing that always bothers me, um, you've heard me say this a lot of times so far, that this player is getting an, a mix, Rainbow's getting a mix of Marines, which means that he's going to be strong in medium to small numbers. In medium to small numbers. Few things hurt me more than players who are getting army composition and then not engaging at those proper at those proper sizes. I think the one that hurts me most is the Marauder Medivac Viking player who sits until he's maxed and then tries to engage Protoss. And Protoss, who's had all the time to get this perfect mix of like Colossi, Templar, and Force Fields and all these Blink Stalkers. And then what happens? Well, we engage, some Force Fields cut the Marauders in half, and then I kill you. But, I mean, if any of you watched Select's stream today, he's been streaming a lot lately, you see Select bounce in small numbers and Marines and Marauders all over the place. They're great in small and medium numbers. Holy cow, they're great in small and medium numbers. Watch QXC player, watch Joe play. These players are doing tons of drops and aggression and poking and prodding with small numbers, and it Fs a Protoss up, right? Because Terran is constantly engaging in these medium to smallish fights. So that's one thing that I really, really, really want you to be considering, is how do I constantly try to get at the right size. If you're going for a big max Colossus army mix, then yeah, you know what, that's really good 
in huge numbers. If you're going for like a big mass tank Hellion push with ghosts, yeah, you know what, that's really good in huge numbers. Marines and Marauders are pretty good in these smallish to medium mixes. So here is where the interesting thing happens. Look at Terran. Terran has a lot of food advantage, 95 to 64. Doesn't necessarily mean he's ahead. He's always going to be getting a food advantage because, again, he's not getting all, all these tanks and upgrades and extra buildings. He's getting nothing extreme. He's staying very clean and lean and pure. So what we see is that 30 food ahead does not necessarily mean actually ahead. Don't apply your other type of game logic to this situation. Another type of game where it's Marine, Marauder, Medivac, Viking, Ghost versus Colossus, Center, Sentry, Stalker all that sort of thing. In those games, the food counts tend to be quite even, but we're not seeing that in this game. In fact, I'm sure you've never seen someone make this many Marines before. Look at that friggin' Marine count, and there's some ghosts there as well, but look at that Marine count. The only player I've ever seen do something similar to this is Straylock, and even then, he doesn't even quite mass his Marines that much. But in this circumstance, yeah, you know what? This mixture is very, very, very easy to kill off. If you're not careful, right? If you're not careful. Look at this. Oh, storm. Oh, it went so terribly. Oh, there's some more EMPs going off. We see the ghost dancing on the front lines. Are you starting to notice something here? There's not actually a lot of stalkers in this mixture. There's not actually a lot of stalkers. That's actually pretty, pretty cool to note. Those ghosts are having a pretty easy time dancing around the front getting in there. Here's the mistake that a lot of people are going to make. They're going to see, they're going to see Rainbow do this. They're going to see these ghosts and they're going to see these marines and they're going to go, oh, you know what? I too can be a marine ghosting player. I'm going to go marines and ghosts. And then they're going to sit till they're at 160 food and they're going to move out and there's going to be stalkers and sentries and colossi killing off their ghosts. It's going to be terrible. But in this game, Rainbow made a bunch of Marines, was attacking with a ton of Marines, being really aggressive with a lot of Marines. The only thing Protoss could really do was go Zealot Templar. That's all he could really do to even stay alive. And then, once that's the setup with the Zealots, Archons, and Templar, now our Ghosts are actually going to be really, really good. It is not that Rainbow said, I'm going Marine Ghost blindly. It's that huge aggression we saw from the Marines early on that are letting the ghosts be good. I mean, just look at the fact that these ghosts are having a free reign here. I'm going to slow it down. Look at these ghosts being able to just hug around here. The ghosts are poaching out in front of the whole army. If there were a lot of stalkers in here, or if there were a lot of um, other units in there, these ghosts wouldn't nearly be as good. So, uh, hey, you know what? Because we're being so freaking aggressive and put off kind of committed to just going um, Archon Templar Zealot, we can end up being quite a bit more effective. And so there's Terran. Look at it, evening up the speed again. But now we're once again hitting this sort of even to smallish, middleish army mix with these Marines are suddenly having such a huge strength. And we see that, uh, again, Terran, who was almost even with the Protoss and food, is now pulled back ahead. Here's the target fire that makes me want to cry. No, come on, man. Oh, no. Dude, dude, it has 130 life. Uh. So that kind of disappointed me that the Terran kind of suicided some units to try to kill it and then didn't kill it and then per usual has rally points that aren't working too good. But again with these small to middle-ish numbers, this this Terran's actually gonna be looking quite good. This is the point in the game where a lot of people will go, ooh, I'm gonna pull back and I have to be a little bit careful with my marine mix. No, no, keep attacking. You wanna be in those small amounts. I mean Terran's pulling back, but only insofar as he can regroup. I mean, look at this, now that he's regrouped. Attack! Move out! Because this is the size when these units are good. Get too much bigger, you'll get killed by like 10, uh, 10 Templar with Storms. If you get too small, you'll get killed with the Speed Zealot. In this middle-ish amount, yeah, I can start poking forward. There's a spin. There's a target fire that botches again! Oh, I hate this sort of target fire because you know what? That's really what screwed Terran up. Because now Terran's behind in food. Alack, alack, alack. Pulling back and back and back. Now we are seeing this army move out once again. So a real question is, all right, day nine, we're at the position where this Terran player who is making all these Marines, great, he can be mobile, he can be aggressive, and he can get ahead in food, but you know what, he's behind in food now. How the hell do you come back from being behind in food at this point? What was one of the advantages of this lean army mixture that we had? We had mobility, we have mobility, right? I mean, I want you just to consider your, your classic Colossus ball in your classic Colossus mix, you have Colossus and some other units. 
That's as simple as a description as I'm ever going to get. And you put these together to get the Colossus Ball. Think about what happens if you have your Colossi hanging out over there. And a bunch of Marauders goes and attacks those Colossi. You know what happens? They die really fast. Like super fast. They die like, immediately. What happens if you have a bunch of um, your gateway units away from your Colossi and a bunch of Marines and Marauders get there? They die really fast. It's when they're together that they're strong, and if they're apart at all, they kind of suck. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about this passive blob style. Remember me talking about that earlier, about, oh, I'm going to build my blob and move out. If you get too many different pieces to try to make your blob impregnable, it's even more important that they kind of huddle up together. But you know what? If you have 12 Marines that go off on their own, you don't need the other 12 Marines there to bolster it. The army mix is lean. You're not going to... If you, if you had like a bunch of Marines and Medivacs, yeah, you shouldn't have your Medivacs over here and your Marines over there because they work well together. But when you have these huge army mixes like this, where you're having just one type of unit, it's, it works out a lot better when you're able to sort of split things up like this. This is why I love when players going Marine Marauder Medivac still a somewhat lean force, because it's really only three Marines. Like, I love it when they end up being these little tiny roundabout things. Because you know what? They work well in small numbers, and it's not like we're missing some key core fancy thing. That's why a lot of times you'll see Zerg players run off with a couple of Zerglings. You don't need anything fancy to make those Zerglings work well. You just don't need it. So here the Marines are running around, trying to do a little bit of a distraction action. We see some long-range mining going on here. That's, that's less than desirable, but... So what's happening, and there's not that much that Rainbow can really do about that. Yes, Zell, it's moving in, being scary. Watch out, watch out. Oh, getting stormed, getting cut to pieces. But look at this. Oh, my goodness, running up and doing a lot of damage. And this is, I think this is a part in a game where most people are going to go, Oh, oh, uh, Terran got lucky. Uh, if that gold expansion hadn't died, it would have been, uh, and he would have won. But I actually want you to just kind of look at the mini-map right now. Look at that mini-map with me. Join my mouse cursor. Yeah, look at this mini-map. When did Protoss ever really have a chance in the last 10 minutes to take an expansion? When, in the last 10 minutes, really, did Protoss have a chance to take this base? Or this base? Or this base? He really didn't. Because the aggression and the mobility of those Marines was so intimidating. Even though Rainbow's losing them by the bucket loads and doing this runaround thing, and, you know, we even see again the corpses of them, the stains, the smudges of their blood on the ground. But Protoss never really had a chance to expand elsewhere. Meanwhile, look at Terran, who's kind of freely able to, you know, mine long range. This expansion has never even been under any threat. This expansion has actually had no real threats against it for a long time. And if there were, you know what? Take some Marines, kill off the small number of units, and then go back on the uh, aggression again. That is kind of the optical illusion that we're seeing happen in this game. It's so easy to be like, ah, Protoss was really close. Oh, if he'd held that gold, he would have won. Yeah, you know what? If he would have held the gold, he would have won. But it's not like the Protoss had any other options than hope my gold stays alive. I mean, this is, an, a, this is a very, very tough, stressful spot to be in as our Protoss buddy. Because of this relentless marine aggression. So here comes another huge attack from Terran, right? Here comes, a, or excuse me, a huge attack from Protoss. We're at the 27 minute and 19 second mark. There's really been, like two attacks this whole game. This is one of them. And the other one was when that base trade occurred. And I suppose there was one that kind of happened at the start. But you know what? The, the starting skirmish with the Zealot and the Stalkers is so normal that I'm not even going to I'm going to completely ignore it. There's really only been two major attacks this whole game. This one and the base trade. Protoss has not really had a chance to attack. How many attacks have you seen Terran do this game? Millions, right? And tens and tens and tens of them. There's so many freaking attacks going on from Terran in this game. So many, so many, so many attacks. And that is what is making this strategy very effective. Again, this is n it's not an optical illusion. Do not convince yourself that, oh, Protoss just he sort of had the game and then he sort of messed up the off and Terran got lucky. There's a doing this relentless progression stuff. Oh, hey, you know what? More Marines doing all sorts of insane, crazy micro action. 
Getting a few great EMPs off. Oh no, yet another effective storm, but uh-oh, we're starting getting into middle-ish zone, and it's like all Archons against Marines, but in middle-ish to small numbers, Marines are so freaking good, six Archons, not a problem. And suddenly we see these, these scores get even out so much in that little mix, and now Protoss is just in horrendous shape, except for the Zealot, it's awesome. Protoss is in horrendous shape because he's just desperate to get some more minerals up. And again, when could Pro can Protoss really expand at any point? No, because the instant that this attack was done, Terran's back on the offensive. In fact, the instant that anything was done, Terran would be on the offensive. Terran was on the offensive, on the offensive, constantly, constantly, constantly. All right, Protoss now realizes, oh, maybe I need to take another expansion. Nope, 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 here comes another huge push. I'm always a little leery of uh, moves like this. Ooh, let's send out Marines out. Nope, nope. I guess the speed zealots are pretty good because in small numbers, in small numbers, Marines are not so good. But in medium-ish numbers, they're awesome. And again, relentless aggression from Terran with this lean mix of Marines. Oh, man, now I can make ghosts. Are there any colossi or stalkers here to deny these ghosts? Nope. Just zealots. You can kind of charge past the zealots. It's nice. Uh, I think Rainbow's being a little bit sloppy, but you know what? This sort of aggression is awesome. It's awesome. It's doing great. Uh-oh, we're starting to approach that medium to largest amount, medium-ish to large-ish amount of Marines. Gotta be a little bit careful. Uh, ooh, this is perfect storm. Absolutely perfect. Obliterating, but the instant we get to kind of a medium to smallest amount. Oh, these Marines are working so well again. So, given our logic. Should Terran be attacking right when this attack is over? Yep. Yep, he should. He should absolutely be getting all up in it with him, yo. And that's exactly what we see the Terran do. And what else is Terran doing? Rallying right to the battlefront. Very rare to see a player who is this aggressive and rally. You never see rallies this fierce, right? But here, oh, in these small numbers of the Zealous getting warped in, more Marines sort of passing in. Hey, these food counts are kind of even, but you know what? If they're in relatively small numbers, this is working out just awesomely. Terran taking another expansion. Again, Terran can take expansions more easily, because he's the one being more aggressive. Protoss can't really take more expansions more easily. And actually, even if we rewind, I mean, here it's kind of obvious. Protoss can't really expand more, because he's fucking dead, right? But like... Even like a few minutes ago, even like right here at the 28 minute mark, if we just bounce back for a moment, or even bounce back even farther to right when this gold was getting uh, first taken, like really when is Protoss going to take another base? Really when is Protoss going to take another base? Oops, he's going to get an attack down here, he's got to be careful for this. Okay, oh, yep, there's a huge attack coming out right now, got to kind of defend this. Can Protoss expand here? No, can he expand? No, still no, can he expand? Not really with much stuff happening right now. Can he expand? Uh, well, yeah, now actually, can, oh wait, no, no, better not expand. Uh, now, yeah, you know, even at this point, it's kind of a little bit weird to expand because there's like so many units moving around the map. Can, I, I can't even expand, I can't even really attack. Oh, oh, jeez, oh, damn, he killed that. I better re-expand, but you know, I couldn't really expand before. I was only down to one base. Very cool to see that. Very cool. You know what? I'm almost glad that I completely botched this on, on the first record. Because this is some very eye-opening, cool stuff to see. Um, with these lean army mixtures with not many units, feel free to get a little bit more aggressive. Or do things in a little bit more of an extreme way. I don't want to convince you that you have to just do attacking. But you can do something like expand a little bit more extremely. Expand a little bit harder. Um, you know, like a Zerg player who's going just mutilist could really end up expanding a lot more and making a lot more fine fun. That's kind of what we see in practice. A Protoss player who is uh, going for gateways with almost no geysers, he can end up getting a lot of expansions and a lot of stalkers himself. Um, and he has like 12 gateways and 4 bases. Wow, 12 gateways, that seems like so many. Yeah, you can go a little overboard, that's absolutely fine to go a little overboard because we're being lean on our mixer. And of course, a little discussion of Zomda, 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 can't you kill me with just them Marines, and then LOL, 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 of course I did, you're awful. But what got me really excited is I want to come back to what I was saying earlier about StarCraft 1. In StarCraft 1, we have these amazing dynamic games with battles going on over here and over there, and little tiny micro arenas in the midst of these huge swells of armies that are dashing around everywhere and all that sort of good jazz. 
And the question is, why don't we see that enough in StarCraft II? It's because players have not experimented enough with these beautiful, lean, tiny, teensy little army mixes where it's just one or two units. And they've tried to peel away all the other possible units and see what just this set can really do for me. And that's a very, very exciting prospect for me because as we've seen in this game, there were tons of battles going on all over the place in some very tense moments. And it all came down to a lot of micro and macro and reinforcing and picking good spots to attack and clever uh, dances with the... With the um, ghosts versus the zealots and the templar and the aggression forced fewer stalkers and fewer anti-ghost things in the mix very very cool it was not marines and ghosts are a good mix that is not a true statement marines and ghosts if you just sit and build up you're gonna you're gonna die it's gonna go horrible and you're gonna feel pain but if you do marines with a lot of aggression and then eventually mix in the ghosts and be very, very aggressive and be very, very, very aggressive and expand and be very, very aggressive, that is a mix that will work. That is a strategy that will work. So this was an extremely exciting example where we saw the Protoss making the right units, Speed Zealots, Archons, Templar, but just couldn't seem to beat marines. Oh, how cool, because Rainbow timed the aggression right and threw in just that little extra bit of variety, the ghosts, at the right time after the aggression had kicked in. Bam! I am going to now wrap up this daily. I hope that it is recorded properly. I can see that you can still hear me. Yeah! Again, for any of you who didn't catch the memo, I have done this daily once already today, and it did not record. That's okay. I like sitting alone in a room talking to myself. Hope you enjoyed Day and I Daily number 64. Once again, please go to the Kingston HyperX community page, which is facebook.com slash HyperX community, and vote for the grand final winners to hang out with me and in control for a day at PAX. Yes. That is it signing out. And when I press this F9 button, I will disappear into the wind. Goodbye. Mwah. You're all awfully pretty. Cheers from Germany. Ciao.